Well, good afternoon, everybody. There's still some people trickling in, um, presumably from the luncheon debate. I personally found that very intriguing because as Energy Commissioner for 10 years, I was also the state's liaison to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I've been on both sides of these arguments, so anyway. But I won't state my bias at all. All right, I think it's, we're past time to get started, so I'm going to get started. Um, I owe my ability to even present my written notes uh, to Commissioner Jeff Byron sitting in the audience, whose um, who's, uh, cheater glasses I'm wearing right now, because uh, <laughs> I opened my briefcase and there were no glasses there. But uh, since we spent a lot, I'll have more to say about former Commissioner Byron in a moment. Um, well, good afternoon. Welcome to what I'm calling the second annual SVS panel on the water energy nexus. Uh, or, but the, the program uh, accurately states, because that was an inaccurate description, the panel to be the fluid future for California's H2O or water. Um, a very interesting title. Uh, I never asked who, where it exactly came from, but, but it had to be different than last year. Well, I am as advertised in the, in the program, uh, Jim Boyd, the moderator of the panel. It's certainly my pleasure to be here. Um, even though I'm a Cal man, I'm shoving it in everybody's face and, uh, <laughs> as best I can. <laughs> Not wearing red. I won't get any, uh, I won't get any hors d'oeuvres if I don't take it off later. I'm sure. <laughs> but I really wore it for one reason, my dear, dear friend and former Commissioner Jeff Byron, who is sitting in the audience, and uh, we serve together on the Energy Commission at least part of the time. And I'm Cal, he's Stanford. We bet on the big game every year. I had to wear a red tie every year because my, <laughs> my academic institution just couldn't field a football team during those times. So I thought, here's my chance to wear my Cal tie on his turf in, in any of it. Okay, um, quickly. Um, when I looked at the kind of, I, I was kind of late as a, as a panel moderator, and when I, and I've been awfully busy lately, and when I looked at the program the other day, and when I look at my badge this morning, it says Jim Boyd, Boyd Group Consulting. That's a title I hide behind um, when, when my wife accuses me of, of having failed at retirement. Well, I'm working a little bit on the side, <laughs> whatever. I don't know how they came up with it, but we did have trouble with my computer getting them but you know, it would have been more fashionable to say former energy commissioner like Commissioner Byron says, but also might have rationalized for you a tiny bit. What's this guy doing moderating this water energy panel? And, uh, and if you were wondering by not figuring out uh, the printed program, well, le let me give you just a quick summary of why I have any license at all to be standing here and, and trying to deal with three experts in the water arena. I, as I said, I spent 10 years, two terms as an energy commissioner and vice chairman of the, of the commission. And believe me, you get really deeply steeped in the water energy nexus when you're, when you're at the energy commissioner dealing um, with um, energy generation in the state. And most of you have known or do know, and it certainly was a highlight of last year's discussion, we use a lot of water um, in California uh, with regard to, to energy. We use a significant amount of energy to just move and process water in California. It's very significant. And during the electricity crisis, which I survived, um, we, we, it became very important. We, of course, historically have had hydropower in the state. You need water to generate that. Our amount in the state has been declining. Uh, thank you to climate change, sadly. We still get a fair amount from the Northwest. So it's, it's a major slice of our um, menu of, uh, of uh, power sources and power plants use a lot of water for cooling um, and uh, um, that has to be taken into the equation. But the Energy Commission quite a long time ago forbade the use of potable water for cooling uh, and at least uh, made that step even before we had um, drought issues. And preceding my Energy Commission stint, which is probably a product of having worked on the energy crisis or the electricity crisis, I was Deputy Secretary of the Resources Agency, and we oversaw multiple agencies like DWR uh, and the Energy Commission that, that were dependent on, one way or another, water. 
And absent from my too long resume, I noticed was the fact I spent eight years of my life at the Department of Water Resources. So I'm, I've had a lot of exposure to water. And the one thing I learned as a very young um, idealist adult um, after my two terms at DWR was that um, water was really the modern day, modern day starting maybe in 1900, modern day gold in California. And that's, that's been true, it's been ignored a lot, or it's been battled over as though it were gold, but um, to me we haven't made as much progress as we need to make, and that's hopefully what we can talk about today. Um, frankly, when I registered to come to this conference, I've been many times, I was going to come, um, I, I signed up as nothing more than a retired senior. I just was going to sneak in, pay the cheapest rate, and, and, and I qualified for all that. <laughs> that, that. That only lasted a few hours because former Commissioner Byron, um, I, I did bother to mention to him, I'm coming down to see you, and the next thing I know, here I stand as a moderator of a panel on the Water Energy Nexus. Um, actually, Jeff, a planner of this whole conference, um, moderated the first ever panel, this, this very panel, last year. So uh, it was indeed a pleasure for me to, to accept Jeff's gracious invitation to moderate um, and, and to have something to do here besides just listen to all this stuff and to pursue an area that's, that, that uh, is important to me. So now let's get down to some important facts about uh, the program for today. We have a very distinguished panel, as you can see from the resumes um, in the program. And I'm very pleased and grateful for their participation because it means I don't have to get very deep into the, the water arena. It's been, it's been a while for me. We have a representative of a local water agency, Jim Fiedler here, of the Santa Clara Water District, um, whom I've discovered is a real boots on the ground individual when it comes to dealing with, uh, in real time, water at the customer or consumer level. And this is an area taking on even more responsibility and importance uh, in these years and this year of continuing water scarcity and new policy direction as it relates to the role of local water agencies, and you'll probably hear more about that. Next on the agenda, and next in line, is David Sedlak. I, um, I've enjoyed talking to David on the phone. As you see from his um, resume, he is a widely recognized expert in water, professor at UC Berkeley, Go Bears, um, head of the Water Center there, uh, a celebrated author on the subject of water, and um, he is going to uh, provide, I am confident, a very interesting uh, perspective in all aspects of water, water history, water supply, development, technology, uh, and the water energy nexus, which, and I believe his presentation will probably provide a platform for our future consideration of this subject. And then thirdly in, in order is um, Fran Spivey Weber, Vice Chair of the State Water Resources Control Board, or SWRCB as we longtime government people always using jargon say. She's a longtime member of, of that board. Uh, she came to the board some time ago with a local water policy experience, and she's someone I've known for quite some time and have interacted on, on water issues during all these uh, ten years uh, in the water arena that I've talked about, not as far back as her Alkin. She's a young woman compared to me, but um, it's been a delight knowing her and working with her um, during the time that uh, our paths crossed. And the water board, of course, has really been at the focal point of of California water issues um, in the last couple of years because of the drought. They were handed responsibility to deal with this emergency situation. And, um, and have, have handled it um, mightily uh, and very well, I think, is just sitting and watching and knowing as I do a fair amount about, about water. Fran was a member of last year's, I call it the premier panel, the first panel on water and energy. So we have continuity here with regard to um, what's happened in the, next, in the past year. And she can sh and will share with us the latest state government policy pronouncements on water conservation, 
and, and water use in California, and I know they've been dealing with a water energy nexus issue for some time, the once through cooling issue. There was an issue even when I was energy commissioner and an issue I'm working on um, in my little once in a while consulting capacity. Okay, a quick comment about uh, the panel program for the day. First, in the order I just gave you, uh, each of the panelists uh, will make um, brief introductory remarks. I'll have the time clock on, on them. Uh, following that, we intend to have a conversation between panelists and their moderator about the issues and questions both emanating from the introductory comments, and then they're free to certainly question each other, um, and to particularly deal with the issues and questions that were put to our entire panel, and including myself, by the, the summit organizers before I came along as the moderator. And uh, as well as a, perhaps, I think I'm probably moving your slides around by accident, Jim, okay, sorry. We're done with my show. Uh, it just, just the weight of paper um, <laughs> is uh, doing it. I just saw it flashing in front of me. And, and then, as I said, the, yours truly, the moderator, uh, has given them a couple of questions and might have a couple of others as we move along. But we're, we're not given a lot of time, so it's a very tall order. Uh, that this panel has to, to cover things. But here are the issues or questions that were put to us by the, by the summit organizers. Number one, California has a limitless supply of water in the Pacific Ocean. Why not desalinate that water and supply it to our thirsty state? But what are the costs and environmental impacts of desalination? How does it compare to other potential water sources such as on-site water recycling or centralized recycling? Second issue. Can our existing method of water storage and delivery be expanded? What are the costs and environmental impacts of increasing our storage capacity? Um, that's going to be interesting within the water energy nexus as a question, but, but, but I'm sure we'll all, and they all, will try to, to, to make it touch that point. Um, and last, um, but certainly not least, um, for this forum is, quote, Energy consumption is a significant consideration when comparing methods of water harvesting. Is the energy calculation enough to tip the scale, or the scales, pick your singular or plural approach, to one source or another? Um, the moderator here has put a couple of other questions to the panel. Uh, first one was uh, California's groundwater. To me, to me personally, a much neglected resource in terms of uh, nurturing and replenishing, uh, not just using. As, um, it's been delayed or put off, in my opinion, far, far too long. When I started my career in government in, at the Department of Water Resources in the 60s, yes, I'm that old, um, engineers and geologists then were talking about the groundwater problem that California faces. And I have watched from the sidelines, or not so much sidelines, um, little to no attention paid to this other than as a source of water, um, in my opinion. So my question is, um, it's back in the limelight because of the drought. We've heard a lot in the past year and a half, two years of, of this issue. You heard a comment this morning about so much groundwater extraction um, in the valley. There's massive subsidence, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the status of our supplies of groundwater? What's the prognosis for the future? And what are the energy implications of where we find ourselves, uh, i.e. use and hopefully recharge? And then secondly, last year the state of California, as I said, in the person of the water board, took charge of managing the crisis. Um, after four years of drought, um, they issued water conservation and emergency regulations aimed at achieving a 25% overall reduction in potable water use. Uh, the time period was uh, June of 2015 through February of 20, or to February of 2016. Now the governor has extended the date, as I understand it, to October of this year. In February, the water board issued amendments to its regs that have many conservationists slash environmentalists up in the up in arms. How does all this relate to our water conservation, water energy, um, and and the energy uh, nexus? How does this relate to, to the progress that we're supposed to be making and to the future we'd like to see? And, and there's so much more we could talk about, but 
as I said, we have limited time and I'm eating into it already. So let's move to the introductory remarks. Um, Jim will come up first or sit there. Well, I guess you have, Jim has got a presentation, which I have botched up so he can back it up. I'll go faster then. And the other two, as I understand, don't have um, slides. So let's move to uh, that. Okay, thank you, Jim. Let's see, well, in conclusion. Uh, well, I will see if I can move this backwards. Sorry if I messed you up somehow. Yes. Okay. Well, let's see here. I won't put the clock on you for what I did to you. <laughs> Very good. All right. I don't know how you moved it forward, but I'll move it forward. Great. All right. Thanks. Again, I'm Jim Fiedler. Happy to be here. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the water situation for Santa Clara County. And you'll hear from the other presenters as they describe a more of a statewide perspective. Again, our agency is the Santa Clara Valley Water District, and we have three primary functions, water supply for Silicon Valley, flood protection, kind of an agency that covers both those functions, and we do that trying to be really be respectful of the ecosystem in our county, so making sure we can provide healthy ecosystems in our streams. Uh, on, the ground, on the clean, reliable supply, we are the groundwater basin manager. We talked about that a second ago with Jim. We also import water into the county. We're the importer. We also manage and operate the local surface storage reservoirs. And so who we serve, Silicon Valley, as you see, it was already on the sli slide earlier, the statistics of who we serve in this county, thriving population, uh, we are all well aware of. This is the map of Silicon Valley or Santa Clara County. It doesn't show the road system. It shows, with the exception of the red line on the very top, it's the infrastructure that's managed by the Santa Clara Valley Water District. This is infrastructure that's been put in place over the last 80 years. Local reservoirs, a lot of uh, treated and raw water pipelines, and these are the raw, trans these are the, the wholesale lines, the large diameter pipelines that transmit water throughout the valley. We're in a portion of the county uh, in Sanford that is served water from a contract that Stanford has with the city and county of San Francisco. So the water you're enjoying today is Hetch Hetchy water. It's derived from O'Shaughnessy Dam uh, in the Sierra and brought down and conveyed through the San Francisco system. And that's not shown, that, that line is just the red line at the top of the screen. But anyway, we put together a, a pretty extensive infrastructure over the last 80 years of groundwater management. We have over 400 acres of recharge ponds. We recharge on average about 100,000 acre feet a year of water into the groundwater. And that water is local stored water in our local reservoirs, as well as water that we import from the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. So we see, you saw the slide earlier. Uh, in our region here, uh, over half our supplies are imported, uh, which is different than other parts of the Bay. In the San Francisco service area, over 80% of the water is imported. East Bay mud, a great, a great majority of water imported. Half our water supply here, 40% through the Delta. The other percentage is really local water that we're able to manage sustainably through a, a storage in our reservoirs and then percolation into our groundwater basin. And then we talked about groundwater earlier and that subsidence issue. This is the, a chart that shows uh, the historical record of the Santa Clara Valley Water District. The blue line is basically a depth to water in a groundwater index well in San Jose. Uh, the, the green line is population growth that's occurred over the last 80 or so years. The top line is subsidence. In this county, we've had land surface subsidence historically. In fact, it shows up there 13 feet between 1915 and 1970 of subsidence, which is why some of the areas in North San Jose are affected by levees in parts of Palo Alto because the land has subsided due to over-pumping of the groundwater basin. But you see, what we've done in our agency is but through the management of groundwater and basically recharging, you see in the late 1920s, the first drop there, our agency was formed, we built local reservoirs, the groundwater table rebounded. But post-World War II boom in Silicon Valley, or before Silicon Valley, uh, you see the groundwater table falling to the 1960s. That's when we brought imported water into the county. You see the rebound of the, of the blue line forward. In the late 80s, we brought in additional imported water, and you see the rebound there. Those also coincide with drought periods. You see at the very end, the current drought, and you see the, the groundwater table continuing to fall there. We've had a rebound due to the incredible conservation efforts of our region. And this is the graph, not, not of water, this is the graph uh, moving really fast. How do you pay for it? This is a chart that shows our historical and projected water revenue, our water rates, that is, that's going to pay for much of the infrastructure that we're enjoying. 
And so you can see the cost. Here we are, 19, uh, our 2017 fiscal, $1,000 an acre foot for treated water in, in Santa Clara County. And you see that going up to about 2300 by 2026. And that's due to a number of factors. Uh, we're spending millions of dollars, close to billions of dollars, on infrastructure in our county. And the, we pay for that through volumetric rates, and that's how we fund our programs. So looking at uh, the energy connection, we're certainly trying to drive for carbon neutrality. Certainly our conference here is on energy. We're doing that through a number of different means as we consider our energy footprint in water. Um, here's a chart that shows and gives you a description of the energy uses in California. It was talked about in some of the other sections. You see about 15 to 20 percent of the, uh, the energy used in California is in the water supply chain. Uh, you don't think about that much. In fact, two to three percent of the entire state energy is used to pump water in the California State Water Project, of which we're a participant of. And you see the other distribution of energy usage uh, in uh, our region. This is from the California Energy Commission 2016. Then we look at the intensity of energy in terms of uh, water deliveries. We'll touch upon that with the other panelists. You look at the various costs of energy, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the energy usage per acre foot of water. You see recycled water, that's basically Title 22 water for landscape irrigation or cooling towers. You see imported water costs and the, the about close to, about close to 1,500 uh, kilowatt hours per acre foot. Then you look at advanced purified water with wastewater, treating that to a high quality. Then you look at desalination, taking basically ocean water and converting that to drinking water and the energy footprint that that would take about uh, over 2,500 uh, kilowatt hours per acre foot. Then you look in our region, how does energy use in the delivery of water that we deliver to Santa Clara County? We convey the water through uh, the water that's imported into our region. That energy costs anywhere from zero to about close to 1,000 kilowatt hours per acre foot. We treat it at three conventional water treatment plants. There's an energy footprint there. We distribute that. There's an energy footprint to pump that and distribute that. And then look at the end user uh, kilowatt hours, which is substantial because the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, sources of energy uses in water is heating water in the homes. And then you know, there's a wastewater component then that processes it at the back and puts it back into the hydrologic cycle. So as we think about what's driving us thinking about how do we make better use of our limited water resources, certainly the drought's been a factor, our limited supplies. You saw an earlier photo in one of the other sessions that showed this is uh, Lake Orville in 2014. It was pretty, uh, pretty dry. This is the, basically the backbone of the state water project uh, north of the delta. Uh, extraction of groundwater and certainly subsidence issues. That's happening in the Central Valley. And then a major concern of ours as well, we don't want the reinitiation of land subsidence. So we're looking very carefully at uh, recycled water, purifying water. Uh, it's a local source. Uh, we can locally control it. Uh, we can drought proof it because we're no, it won't be subjected to the variability of hydrology. Uh, and it certainly is a, a source of water we're actively involved and engaged in. So this chart earlier, uh, our region's been expanding the use of recycled water. Currently about 5% of the water used in Santa Clara County is recycled. We have great aspirations to really make great strides to increase that. Mostly it's non-potable uses, that is for landscape irrigation, cooling towers. In fact, you remember the Super Bowl at Levi Stadium? 80% of the water used at Levi Stadium is recycled water uh, from, the city county, or from the city of San Jose that's processed through our advanced purification plant. But we have great aspirations for the future as shown on here. We want to develop over 45,000 acre feet of recycled water, purify that for groundwater recharge, potentially for direct potable reuse. And here's kind of a, an idea of what the potential is. What you see there is the uh, average 2015 wastewater treatment at the four wastewater plants in Santa Clara County, producing about 167,000 acre feet of wastewater. Of that amount, we use about 12% currently. So there's great aspirations to potentially make additional use of this resource as a water supply. And then we have put online, and you're welcome to tour it, we give public tours, our Silicon Valley Advanced Purification Center. It's located in North San Jose. It's an 8MGD facility brought online in 2014. It uses a great technology of microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and UV light disinfection to really show how we can treat wastewater, uh, secondary effluent from a wastewater plant, to basically drinking water quality, and how we can apply that in our future to meet our long-term needs. And here's how we are thinking about doing that. Currently, the purple line, the purple pipe, is really the, the traditional way of using uh, recycled water from a wastewater plant. We put online our purified uh, facility. We're hoping to, uh, and we're blending that, that water from that facility to help improve the quality of the non-potable water. But we're looking at now, how can we expand the use of that advanced purification to recharge in our groundwater basin, 
or potentially if regulations allow to allow us to use that water as a source water, a raw water source water for our conventional surface water treatment plants for delivering to homes and businesses. And this is an outline of some potential projects that we could have online to help move that water from an advanced purification facility down to our recharge areas. And so certainly a sustainable tomorrow for us is going to involve using recycled water. It's good for the environment. Uh, it provides that drought proof supply. And certainly the technology as it gets improvements through the years can certainly allow us to uh, save on some of the energy costs that it takes to really operate a system of that nature. With that, I'll stop. And I know we have the other panelists and we'll take questions. Thank you, Jim. David. We've got it right down to the minute. So I'm not going to use any slides at all. And I'm going to um, take advantage of, of Jim's remarks to, to not say too much about the energy water nexus. Um, uh, I appreciate the invitation to come here because too often I spend my time talking to water people and not energy people. And it's the same discussions over and over again. And we talk about the progress we're making. We try to compare notes on the technologies we're excited about. But you know, there's this whole other world here of energy that is making a, a big difference to how the state thinks about sustainability, how it shows us how infrastructure can change over time, and how the confluence of technological innovation, uh, government regulation, uh, political will can bring about big change. And so we look to the energy sector to teach the water sector how to move forward. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you what's going on a little bit in the water sector and how it might be connected to energy and not to talk about the usual truisms about the water energy nexus that you've heard so much about in the past, but to touch on where I think California is going, especially with respect to the municipal sector. So you heard from Jim about uh, the water uh, energy nexus. Maybe another way to think about it, if you don't think about acre foot too often, or even if you're not always thinking about kilowatt hours, is that the average California family has a 50 watt uh, light bulb burning in their house all the time. And that light bulb is the water infrastructure that's providing them with residential water. And so when we think about how to reduce energy use, we think about what we could do uh, on that piece of the water pie. But that's not what's driving change in the urban water sector these days. It's really about supply reliability. And so Jim doesn't wake up every day thinking about, oh my goodness, it's going to cost a lot of money to have the power for this energy. It's that my community could be running out of water someday. And so how do I plan ahead? And the way in which California cities are going is taking on four different approaches. Uh, the first one is demand management. I think you think a lot about demand management in the electricity sector. We think about it in the water sector. Uh, urban stormwater capture, that is the rainwater that falls on cities being captured and put into the ground as a water supply. Uh, water reuse, you heard Jim talk about a little bit. And then uh, seawater desalination, which Jim, the other Jim int uh, introduced in his remarks as something that we should try to touch on during this meeting. And I want to talk a little bit about all four of those and the energy implications. And then give you some things that you might not expect based on your instinct as energy people when thinking about water, which could be perilous traps as you try to apply what you've learned from energy to water. So let's start, first of all, with demand management. Um, we hear a lot about the analogies between demand management in water and the demand management in energy. Certainly there's room for conservation. So indoor conservation is a great thing to do in terms of saving money and having a return on investment, especially if it has to do with hot water. That's why front-loading washing machines and things that reduce uh, heating of water are so attractive to utilities in the water and power sector. But what a lot of people don't realize is that we're going to reach a point with indoor water conservation where it's going to bottom out. So in electricity, you'd like to drive electricity use in the house to zero. In the water sector, we are only going to drive it down to about 25 to 35 gallons per person per day. Because if we drive water use down below that, the sewers stop working. And we have massive corrosion in our sewer system. And we can't just abandon the sewer system as it is. So we have uh, a lot of policies in place that are going to drive indoor water conservation down but at some point it's going to stop and we're going to be like Israel or Australia or those existing technologies and then there are going to be few opportunities for indoor water conservation. Um, outdoor water conservation is a huge opportunity and we saw that during the current drought that it's pretty easy to replace lawns with California friendly landscaping but there are two traps here. 
The first trap is the urban heat island effect. If you rip out all the plants, you rip out all the shade trees, the cooling demand grows. And people don't like living in cities that are just concrete jungles. And so the public is going to push back at some point, and it's going to be wise to not push beyond a certain point anyway. So with those two, we could probably reduce water use, urban water use, by somewhere around 30%, just like we did during the current drought. There's also another area of demand management, and that's pressure management and leak control. If you think about uh, managing pressure within the water distribution system uh, and uh, replacing pipes to, uh, to stop leaks in California, something about like 5% of the water we put in our urban water systems leaks out, and that's a waste of energy. We've done the analyses on this, and we put it in kind of the context of the McKinsey curve that you may be familiar with, and it's negative in the McKinsey curve. That is, uh, it's, there's a good return on investment from doing both pressure management and leak detection in urban water systems, and it's not being exploited enough by water utilities due to some uh, logistical and institutional issues. Um, switching now to uh, stormwater capture, this is something that's becoming very popular in Southern California. A lot of political will behind this idea of capturing stormwater and putting it back into the ground. It's not quite as proven a technology as the other ones. There needs to be more research and development. There needs to be more demonstration projects. So these projects probably are going to grow more slowly, and some of them are going to be green infrastructure that is going to um, satisfy members of the public but not yield a great deal of water for water utilities. So it's going to, we're going to make investments in it, but it's probably not going to yield a lot of water for urban districts immediately. And that's why the urban water uh, districts are more interested in water reuse and desalination as a reliable supply because their proven technologies and engineers feel comfortable with them. So with respect to water reuse, um, Jim mentioned the purple pipe system, like South Bay water recycling. A number of cities in California have these so-called purple pipes or non-potable water. And um, I could tell you that if I had a crystal ball here, I'd tell you that we're not going to build too many of these in the future. That is, these centralized, non-potable water reuse systems turn out to be uh, economically unattractive. Not only that, but they, uh, they facilitate uh, the proliferation of golf courses and lawns and the kinds of water uses that we're not so comfortable with. And so utilities are doing just what Jim was talking about, pushing towards potable water reuse, because the technology has been proven by projects like the groundwater replenishment project in Orange County um, that's been operating for, I mean, the Water Factory 21 plus the groundwater replenishment project going on 40 years now. So it, it's a, a proven, uh, permittable, designable, buildable kind of technology, and that's why there's so much enthusiasm for it. Um, I think you're going to hear more and more talk about doing water recycling at the office park scale or the individual housing development scale, so-called distributed water reuse. There are a number of institutional challenges associated with doing this. There's going to be a session after this to talk about that. But um, I, I'll just say for now that it's a very small fraction of the plans for future water supplies, and it's going to take some time and effort to actually yield substantial amounts of water from those distributed projects. Um, desalination, we were asked to talk about it. Um, desalination is, uh, is a really interesting story in California. Um, one of the challenges with desalination, I think some of you know that the largest desalination plant in the Western Hemisphere was opened and commissioned in Carlsbad, north of San Diego, uh, this year, 50 million gallons per day. Um, there are two things you might want to think about with respect to the future of desalination in California. Uh, the first of which is that it's an issue that's tied up with once through cooling. That is, a lot of the planned and proposed seawater desalination plants are co-located with power plants, and they rely upon those once through cooling intakes. And so um, there's going to be this kind of tension between uh, those who want to close down these coastal power plants with once through cooling and people who want to build seawater desalination plants there using the same intakes. And so there's a political and permitting uh, 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 complexity. And then there's also... Um, the fact that everyone's concerned about the energy demand of seawater desalination. It's, uh, Jim showed you uh, the figure there. It's about 3.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. Uh, the theoretical minimum is uh, when, you, when you add in the frictional loss and the actual operation of a plant, somewhere around 1.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So with the technologies that are being developed by this maturing industry, we'll see some additional savings in energy, but we're not going to see the kinds of savings in energy that we've seen over the past 20 years. We're really leveling out on the efficiency of seawater desalination uh, 
uh, systems. But there are, is some good news and some opportunities for us to think about. One of which is integrating seawater desalination plants with the grid. So we heard about the duck curve this morning. If we can find ways to store energy and use that energy to run a desalination plant, or you know, there are all these connections between pumped hydro and water supply, and also the possibility of uh, producing water at night when, when energy prices are low. There are lots of opportunities here to think more about how uh, desal plants integrate into the management of the grid. Um, there's a, and along those lines, the Department of Energy and the White House are pushing this uh, pipe parity initiative that they really hope to drive the price of seawater desalination down by 80%. And so there's going to be some efforts happening at the federal level uh, with some of the national labs in the next few years to try to uh, really create a game changing technology by reducing the cost of desalinated seawater from $2 a cubic meter to, to 50 cents a cubic meter. And I think that would really change a lot of our thinking and, and discussions that we would have here today. So before I wrap up, I just wanted to add a couple of things to think about as energy people when you look at the challenges the water people face. First of all, I want you to realize that uh, water isn't energy. And the things that you learned about rooftop solar and distributed generation don't necessarily apply to water. There are technologies out there that allow us to recycle water at the building scale and at the development scale, but they're very energy intensive. So those membrane bioreactors that people talk about putting into office parks or uh, the basements of buildings are about as energy intense as seawater desalination. So I'm always a little bit dumbfounded when I hear people saying that they want to build this because it's a green technology, but then they're opposed to seawater desalination because it's an energy hog. It just doesn't add up to me. And when you look at the cost of doing water recycling at the centralized level, like the project that Jim described, it's much more energy efficient and cost effective. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is that um, you think a lot about energy demand and how it varies over time. In the water field, we think about how water demand varies over time, but we don't think in terms of days, we think in terms of decades. We have some, some years that, are, that we have plenty of water, and we have some years where we don't have much water at all, and we have to have the storage there to get us through those dry years. And so uh, some of the things that we're doing now uh, of outdoor landscape conservation and making the system more efficient is cutting our elasticity. So in this current drought, we had the elasticity of all these lawns that we could let go brown. But as we get more and more efficient, as we reduce the low-hanging fruit, we're going to be at running this system at a much tighter place when it comes to droughts. And we're going to have to build more storage, or we're going to have to overbuild our systems if we're going to get rid of these sources of water that can be adjusted in times of drought. And I think you run into similar things in the energy world, where you look for certain uses of energy to reduce energy use during particularly hot days or periods of high demand. We're going to have to be more intelligent and take some lessons from you as we think about how to evolve the water grid in the future. And with that, I think I'll stop and let Fran. I too am very glad to be here. Uh, I was here last year, and so this is very nice to be coming back and talking to an audience that is not as familiar as uh, as water audiences, and yet much, uh, very much able to uh, to influence how water gets used in the future. And I'm also uh, pleased to be following Jim and David because they, I think they have given you a very, very strong overview of. How, how water works in, uh, in California, and how, uh, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about as we move forward. Clearly, costs will be a big issue. Climate will be a big issue, because the variability that we're seeing that, was refer that David just referred to is going to probably be even greater, and perhaps, uh, we don't really know for sure exactly where it's going to, to fall, less water, more water, but, um, but we, at least we're s suspecting that there will be uh, a lot more variability than we have uh, had in the past. And so what's the, what's the way to go in energy? What you have done is, uh, and, and it, it, it happened in the marketplace, 
Uh, you have largely a few players, some in Southern California, some in Northern California, and uh, there is a, uh, an effort to, to uh, work in, in a very big palette, with a ver very big palette. Uh, in water, in contrast, there are hundreds, there are thousands. There are little ones, little, 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 little ones, and big ones, yes, for sure, LADWP, but largely it's, it's, very, it's quite varied. And uh, so I think, go back to what Jim was talking about at, at the beginning, there are differences regionally in terms of where the water is coming from, what the challenges are, is it imported? It, do you have groundwater basins? Do you have um, uh, w ways in which to, to do something? And then how do we actually figure out how to get all these very interesting, different groups to work together? And that's where the water board comes in. We are very are, are charged with protecting uh, water quality. Uh, we are charged with allocating water rights and making changes in those water rights. And, and uh, as of two years ago, we also uh, are charged with uh, drinking water and making sure that there is clean, reliable drinking water for most of California. And the uh, the, the key seems to be, and it's based largely on some of the experience that we've had with the, with the drought, is to establish standards that the, uh, that the water agencies can understand and can, can adapt based on their region, can adapt to based on their region, and then hold the water agencies accountable to those standards. That's the current theory that we're, we're operating on, and therefore it will be a very decentralized regional approach. Southern California, Northern California, inland, desert, uh, coastal. And so you're going to, for those of you in the energy world, I think that will be helpful to you because you will be uh, there will be uh, natural allies that you can work with in the region where you are working now as, uh, as you move forward. The, uh, another factor that has gone into uh, helping us get to this point is, is Governor Brown. Uh, because Governor Brown has uh, came into his new job, uh, several years ago, not uh, seven years ago, uh, six years ago, uh, having done it before and being older, uh, he has really emphasized, as has his governor's office, integration of the various agencies. So while, uh, while Jim and I work together a lot on the water energy nexus, now we work more on the water energy nexus. And it's not easy to work with agencies that are like yours uh, or that are different from yours, but we're learning how to do it. We're spending a lot more time together and the governor's office is spending a lot more time pulling the various agencies together to get this kind of, of integration at the, at the regional level as well as at the, at the state level. So that is, um, uh, that has been extremely helpful, and and it has uh, helped us, particularly in this whole new world of climate change. Since we don't know exactly where things are going to be or what is going to happen, we are looking at uh, at things like new water. That would be desalination. It could be recycled water. The emphasis has largely been on recycled water. And right now, the Division of Drinking Water is overseeing the, uh, the, the rules that will apply to, surf, to augmenting or increasing the amount of water in a surface water res reservoir with recycled water. They have already created some uh, regulations for 
uh, groundwater recharge, using recycled water to recharge groundwater. So th uh, this undersco underscores what, uh, what David mentioned, that we are moving, I won't say we're moving away from purple pipe, because purple there is a lot of purple pipe out there, but whether there'll be a lot more purple pipe in the future is, uh, I, I would have to agree with David, that it's, it's uh, somewhat unlikely it's much more uh, advantageous to go with groundwater recharge and with, uh, with surface water augmentation. And we're looking at the feasibility of direct, what's called direct potable reuse, taking recycled water and spending a lot of money to treat it, but making it uh, more usable uh, directly. That's still, uh, that's still a, a, a at the research level, but it's not, uh, it's certainly not out of the, out of the realm of possibility in the, in the, what I would call the medium term, in the next five to 10 years. On desalination, uh, desalination is, is very attractive. I call it the, the bright, shiny object. And uh, I can't tell you, I do not go to a party that someone doesn't ask me about desalination as the answer. Well, it's just not. It just, it just isn't for all kinds of reasons, but is it a component of some communities solving their water, their water problems? Of course, of course, but it's not the panacea. It's not the thing that's going to save us. In San Diego, they have very few groundwater basins. And so looking at desalination makes some sense to them. In Monterey, they have very little water, lots of big developments, and so they are looking at desalination as a, as a, a possibility. But again, it's very regional and it's very, uh, it has to be integrated because the people who get the water, whether it be desalinated water, recycled water, imported water, whatever water you get, the people are gonna have to pay for it. And they cannot, even, even uh, with the numbers that, uh, that Jim Fiedler put up as to what, are, what the cost of water is going to be in the future, and it is going up, no doubt about that, it is, uh, it is going to be extremely important to conserve, to reduce, to the greatest extent practical, just like you've done with, with energy, to reduce the amount of, of water just as you've done with energy, uh, to the, reduce the, the amount of water that you need in order to flush the toilet, in order to grow a garden, in order to uh, keep trees in your area and, and avoid the heat island effect. Conservation is going to be the most cost effective, the, most, the, the centerpiece of every uh, region that, that, pursues, uh, that pursues a water plan. And I think that is a smart way to go. And then you start to add to it, depending on your local conditions, those other things that, that you can do. And the law and technology will be your friend in all of these efforts. Thank you. Okay, since I chewed up some of the time at the beginning and, and uh, messed up Jim's presentation, I'm going to limit uh, any pursuit of questions I did ask. I am going to ask, well, I'm going to make an observation. One, the purple pipe thing, that was very interesting to me because um, as a commissioner for 10 years, that's what we were requiring, purple pipelines to power plants, new proposed power plants for their cooling water. So I presume that purple pipe won't go away. Um, unless we stop building power plants and go other, other ways. But in any, in any event, that's just, just not a question, just an observation, I interesting thoughts about recycled water. Uh, I, think, I think all the panelists touch upon all the questions that, that were asked of us, um, with one exception, my question, uh, which really goes to Fran, if she wants to say anything about um, this, your regulations proposals uh, with regard to the conservation program, and I'm bringing it up only because as I, in my limited knowledge about what you're doing, see it, 
you're bringing the local this, your local water agencies more into the picture of being responsible and having a role in this. Now, correct me if I'm wrong and say whatever you might want to say about that. Because it has caused a lot of concern on the part of people think, oh, they're not going to, you know, the state needs to do it. They're not, they're not going to achieve the goals that we set. What we've learned over the last uh, several years in, in working on conservation is that we really do need, uh, we, we do need to do more to uh, enable local water agencies to, uh, to do the right thing, to uh, pursue conservation, to pursue other, other uh, sources. So what, what are we going to do? Uh, the governor has extended, actually uh, until, the, until January of next year, has extended the executive order, but has given a lot of leeway to the state board as to uh, what they should do, particularly over the long term. Uh, and so we'll be putting together an advisory committee in the next uh, month, and we will be developing uh, regulations that probably around the idea of standards that would then go out and get implemented locally uh, by, uh, by water agencies. But exactly what those standards would be, whether it would be 55 gallons per capita per day indoors, as, as is on the books now, or uh, are we striving toward the 25 or, or 30 uh, gallons per capita per day indoors uh, in the future? What kinds of outdoor landscape is, uh, is a standard that we should be using so that people can choose whether to put in trees or whether to uh, put in gardens or, or exactly what it is that they want to do? We'll be doing that, but we're going to do it fast. We're going to uh, get this the draft put together uh, by October uh, with help from the local agencies, and then we will be um, uh, fine-tuning it and uh, making it available to the governor to, if the governor is interested in putting it out as legislation next year. And there are some other changes that, that, that will be going on, but that will be the biggest one. It will be, uh, will be that. Now, on the short term, between now and the, end, uh, the beginning of next year, if every water agency is going to have to continue to send in their uh, their monthly production numbers and if someone has been producing here and suddenly they're producing way up here we'll make a phone call and we'll f try to figure out what's going on and we can change our minds about kind of the local uh, control over over what's going on if we see a need to at this point, of course, we see we don't see a need, and in fact, I just looked at the April numbers, and we definitely don't see a need based on the April numbers. So, um, I, you know, we have the ability to turn around and change our minds, but for right now, we're trusting that the locals do want to uh, do a, do the right thing. Thank you, Fran. Um, to the other panelists, do you have any questions of each other before we go to the audience? I want to give them a chance. We have a good sized audience here. None. Okay. Questions from the audience in the limited time we have left. I saw Russ's hand go up first. Ah. Speak up it, while they, they're so, working on my. So, um, here. I'm working on a project for the California Energy Commission. Here comes the mic. <laughs> I'm working on a project for the California Energy Commission uh, under a grant uh, called the Zero Net Energy Farm. And, and this uh, water energy nexus is very interesting to me. We're in the uh, Westlands uh, Water District. Um, <clears throat> and so water is a, is a um, the opinions uh, uh, vary widely. <laughs> and, and, and the interest groups seem to be the environmental use of water, the agricultural use of water, and the urban use of water. We're trying to focus on uh, uh, renewables that are on demand uh, that can be generated on site on the farm from anaerobic digestion and, <clears throat> and gasification so we don't exacerbate the problems of the duck curve. It, do you think that it would be possible to, to um, quantify the amount of water that's used in the production of non-renewable electricity and, and provide that as an incentive uh, for agricultural interests adopting renewable energy strategies in the Central Valley. 
So maybe you, you can inform me about something. Um, my impression is that a lot of the water used in, uh, in power production in California is seawater for the coastal plants and hydro, which I, I don't know how one accounts for it, uh, unlike much of the rest of the country. So do you have a suspicion that there's a lot of water used in electricity production within California? The, the, the generalized figures that I see are um, uh, 20 gallons of water per kilowatt of electricity. And I, I don't know what the offset is for uh, salt water consumption or purple pipe water. Um, but uh, uh, it, it would be interesting to find out from the panelists, you know, if that sort of calculation. We talk about the water energy nexus, but it, it, it appears as if it, the information is siloed. You know, has anyone figured that out? Uh, I have seen numbers on the uh, on the use of water for production of, of petroleum, and that's the, it's huge. Uh, it really is quite large. However, it comes from a different place in the ground, uh, and it is um, it, it's regional. It's, it's in Kern County. It's in a, a, a section of the of the uh, state that is not where the urban uh, folks are living. And so, it, you know, it would have to, you'd have to look at it, but, but it's being looked at now, but not, I, I wouldn't say not seriously, and, and I, I'll take a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a contrary position to David's in that I don't think we have even touched, we haven't even started saving water like we could. And so one reason people aren't going to some of these more creative uh, approaches is they don't really have to. There is enough water. Uh, one of the problems that we have in the Central Valley is that people have expanded their footprint for agriculture, and therefore they need more water. It's not that, they're used, that, that, that they don't know how to save water, they've just expanded uh, more. So I think we're going to have to get a little bit hungrier before we go there. Well, right here, and then the man, well, gentleman in the front. Uh, the history man. of water in California, my understanding, is we've sort of taken it through the aqueduct system and moved it from where it is to where it needs to be. Okay, along those lines, why not consider extending the aqueduct system all the way up to the Columbia River, which has a fairly <laughs> excess amount of water and bringing it down? Another sure. water war. <laughs> They already don't like us very much yeah. in Oregon and Washington for I, I buying up the land. It, it well, I, I think not, not being facetious, um, I, I think that we've reached a point where seawater desalination is, is very equivalent. I mean, the, the cost of building massive imported water systems is not negligible, and there's not an infinite supply up north in the Columbia River, and there's a salmon run, and there's dams and everything else. We have the ability now if we get desperate, I mean, Fran talked about it as a bright, shiny object. I think of it as a last resort, that no California city will ever run out of water. We would do what the Australians did during the millennial drought and build seawater desalination plants in a hurry. So I think it's always there for us. And the, what I see as kind of the research challenge is uh, to drive down the cost, to make it not the last resort, but to make it a, uh, a viable resort that starts to displace the imported water systems that are detrimental to the environment. Let me inject during my tenure as an energy commissioner, we studied um, desalinization along with a lot of the folks. And, and actually, the highest priority was assigned to um, desalting brackish water rather than seawater, of which there's a lot of in California. Um, and, and, and the whole issue, you already heard, the issue is it's incredibly energy intensive. So it, that has to be considered in the system. I would also comment that quite a bit of water is used in cooling power plants that is not seawater or coastal water. All the simple cycle, combined cycle natural gas plants that have been built hand over fist the last few years all need cooling water. Um, while they're highly efficient, there's a lot of them, and you saw a power source growing in California. So um, it's been all recycled water for the most part for the last more than 15 years almost. But you know, as we uh, talked about earlier, you know, we're still, even when we make all these investments in conservation and in recycling, or maybe even diesel, you know, much of California is very dependent on imported water. 
I mean, that's sort of our lifeblood. And it's almost like the uh, nuclear energy question we had earlier at, at lunch, you know, because it's so divisive, trying to fix the delta, uh, because that's really the heart uh, of, of California water issues, because so much of the water is imported from the delta to serve many Californians in, in the Ag and Central Valley. So I think it's very important for us to diversify our water supply options with, with the, the, these various straits. We've looked at Brackish, or looking at Carquinez Straits, desalting water there among the you know, Bay Area water agencies, and that might be a source of water that we would then transfer through our various infrastructure piping. But even with those reductions, we're looking to, to expand double our use of recycled water, but we're still very dependent on imported water. And so we need to make sure that system is a reliable force too. This gentleman here, but I would, I would say, well, go ahead. I'm, used up too much time. We're running out of time, so I ask your question. Okay, so hopefully this is quick enough, and this is, I guess, to anyone who wants to answer. In, in terms of uh, potable reuse, looking to the future, do you see direct potable, which is a little further off, indirect potable? Uh, which one of those two do you see being the primary source, or maybe they both play a big part? Eventually, how much of that do you think could be in the water supply, and then do you have a worry that uh, wastewater influence supplies because of conservation efforts, et cetera, are going to dwindle and that you're going to build out your, your treatment capacity on the, the back end too much? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think in the, in the medium term, uh, indirect potable is going to be the, the uh, uh, action of choice. And that would be for groundwater recharge, uh, purple pipe actually still, and, uh, and also surface water augmentation. Longer term, uh, there will be some areas that will want to go to um, to direct potable, but it will be expensive. So the, the, again, it's a regional choice, and it'll be uh, what are your other options, and and have you you know have you looked at the ones that are most optimal? Uh, where you should invest your money in the future, I have no idea, but tell me what you decide to do. Last question, gentlemen, back with the mic. We're, I've run you out of time to get to your next. Uh... So I saw a very alarming presentation on how uh, the groundwater is being depleted in California, and I know there's a law that will eventually address that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think fundamentally the question is, uh, you know, agriculture is using that. Um, we need ag. It's a, certainly a, a good good thing to be doing. How do you see that delta, you know, the difference between the sustainable level uh, of use of the aquifers and what's currently being done? How do we meet that demand? Does Agland go out of, you know, so how, how, how does that get connected? Well, I, I'll just, I'll say two things and then David looks like he's ready to say more. One is, uh, uh, I think, Agri farmers are really smart, and so if they have a limited amount of water, they will move to higher value crops. So they, they move to vines, they move to tree crops, they move to uh, cut flowers down in, in San Diego. So there will be changes in agriculture. I do not think we will lose agriculture. We'll see. I have a comment. I didn't appreciate your laughing at my friends suggesting that we go to the Columbia River. <laughs> well, he, it, 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 no, it is, it, it, it is not funny. You know, I mean, I don't know if it's funny. It is a little bit funny, but uh, it, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it is a political challenge, but it's mostly a cost challenge and a delay challenge. If you have to get permits, if you have to uh, build these things, are there cheaper ways to go? And yes, there are many, many, many other cheaper ways to go. So, colonization is cheaper? Yeah, absolutely, positively, yeah. absolutely. You know, maybe what they said in the movie Chinatown, if, if you don't bring the water to the people, you bring the people to the water. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's one, one reason why Oregon would give us the water, because they don't want us to come to Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> would you join me in thanking this panel? And